Welcome to the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast by Venus O'Hara. I'm here to welcome you into the world of orgasmic living by hosting experts to discuss orgasmic topics such as nutrition, spirituality, personal development, sexuality, and much more. Here, we will offer lifestyle lessons that can help you lead a fulfilling, joyous, and orgasmic lifestyle. I'm your guide, Venus O'Hara. Welcome to the 57th episode of the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast with Venus O'Hara. In this Harvest Moon episode, we'll be discussing religion, sex, and cannabis. We'll be speaking with Katie Enright, founder of Lavinia, a cannabis lubricant brand. She went from studying to be a nun to founding her own cannabis-powered sexual wellness line. Then, I'll be discussing the book I'm reading now, which is Healing Honestly by Elisa Zipersky. And finally, we'll be experiencing a guided meditation for spiritual sex. But first, let me share with you my experience with wanting to become a nun and then changing my mind. Our guest today went from studying to be a nun to founding her own cannabis-powered sexual wellness line. It made me think about my own aspirations to become a nun, believe it or not. Although I didn't study to become a nun, it was something I thought about when I was about 10 or 11, (laughs) so very young, way before the hormones kicked in. And I was brought up Catholic, and I've always been a, a feminist. I've always believed that in my strength as a woman. And also I didn't really um, aspire to be, to to indulge in the traditional feminine roles of being wife and mother. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but for me, I just wanted to do something else with my life. Become a businesswoman. I have no idea really, but I didn't really think about um, being a wife or a mother. I was always inspired by strong women. I admired strong women a lot. I was a big fan of Madonna like many people, like women or girls in the 80s and 90s. And I remember um, one of my best friends when I was in primary school was really into going to church. We're talking not just um, on Sundays, but also um, different days throughout the week. And she also used to go to this thing called a charismatic mass where you would receive the Holy Spirit. And I was so into it. It was three hours long. I was also really into reading stories about female saints and how they um, express their Christianity in during times when Christianity was illegal or forbidden or or could be punishable. So those stories really inspired me, the the perseverance and the willpower and just the belief and, um, you know, and taking risk just uh, just for for your beliefs, which is something that I found to be very impressive. Yes, yeah, so that was, and then the struggle, I guess, that's something that, that stuck out for me. And um, it was all well, all going fine with my uh, exploration of these strong female saints. But then I read a passage from the Bible um, that it talked about, I think it's from Corinthians, where it talked about man being the glory of God and woman being the glory of man, but man is not the glory, or woman is not the glory of God, or something like this. And I just thought, okay, the book is closing forever. And I never felt that I was less so for being a female. Um, I just, um, it just felt like the right thing to do was to close the book at that time. And also I saw around me lots of hypocrisy where Catholicism was concerned. It was all about being not so nice during the week, but then, um, then going to church on a Sunday and everything was okay. And that, seeing that hypocrisy around me actually made me discover my very first number one value in life, which is integrity. I thought, how about we are good every day and we can save ourselves that boring sermon and and um, ceremony and ritual on a Sunday. And that's something that um, wasn't really appreciated when I expressed that opinion. But I try to live my life in that way. Um, I don't go to church. I think I can understand now I have less contempt towards 
religion and church. I mean, I think it's done a lot of damage to a lot of people, but at the same time, I can acknowledge that the good side, the charity, the um, community that it creates, the rituals, and then some kind of, some people might need that to connect with God, but I don't think you do need that to connect with God personally. I know that from the communities that I'm from in Ireland, I think the church is, is, has held people together in, in many ways, and that's sometimes the only time you actually get to see people in your community is at church. So I can understand from that perspective that it can be very strengthening. Of course, there's a very dark side to the church and religion. And these days, I tend to define myself as a spiritual person, although I do think that New Age spirituality does have some kind of religious aspects to it. But the dogma is not the, not, quite, not quite the same dogma and rules. I think it's a lot more flexible, and that's what I, I like about it. And I like how my spiritual journey gets more and more um, deeper as I progress on that on this path and I feel closer and closer to God all the time. But what, what the definition of God is, is not something that's being told to me. It's something that I am thinking about myself in more flexible terms. So yeah, so I abandoned my ideas of being a nun and um, discovered as my sexuality instead. Well, that obviously came up many years later. But um, I have, um, I when it's um, fancy dress or carnival here in Barcelona in Spain, I always dress as a nun with my red lipstick. And it's something that, um, yeah, it's something that <laughs> reminds me of a previous incarnation of myself. And I'm actually um, planning to go to Rome in a couple of months. I'm really excited about it. And I'm, I'm even excited about going to the Vatican, even though it might represent some unflattering things about the Catholic Church. I, I'm just excited about being among all of that art and um, in history, and um, just to discover Rome, the birthplace of Venus. So yeah, let's hear more from our guest today, Katie Enright, who has a fascinating story. Are you looking for a new sex toy? If you are, go to satisfier.com and you can use the code Venus to get 30% off anything on the satisfier.com website. So check it out. Venus for 30% off, satisfier.com. Now it's time for this episode's interview. We'll be speaking with Katie Enright, founder of Lavinia, a cannabis lubricant brand. Katie Enright, welcome to the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast. Thank you so much for taking part in this interview today. I'm very happy to have you here. For those who are unfamiliar with your work, could you tell us what you do? Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Lavinia. Our whole goal is to enhance people's sex life through cannabis. Amazing. So what inspired you to follow this path? It's <laughs> an interesting story. Tell us the juicy bits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really funny because I think a path is so interesting, right? It's one step leads to another step leads to another step. Uh, never, ever, ever did I think that this would be my career path ever <laughs> in life. Even now, I'm like, wow, I can't believe this is what I'm doing. Um, so I initially started off uh, studying theology and actually discerned if I wanted to become a nun, which is very different than what I'm currently doing. But it is, but it isn't. I always say that I'm still doing God's work just in a different way. One orgasm at a, at a time. So this really intrigued me about your story that you trained to be a nun or you were studying theology. Um, what kind of nun? Was it Catholic nun? Correct. Okay. So I'm from I'm from that, I, I know that thought, I, school of thought. I'm, I was was Catholic as well. So I think it's the best aphrodisiac. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Definitely. So tell us how, this is a very different or interesting journey that you've had then going from studying theology to cannabis. So what happened in between to make you choose this new path yeah um so uh i, I mean it kind of a lot there was a, probably a 10 year period 10 and 15 year period so a lot of changing and growing um i basically i was training for my second marathon and um i started to incorporate cannabis in my recovery and i started making my own balms just for myself for my achy knees and back pain and um just for for recovery and I started to develop a, a really strong, passionate love for cannabis because it was something that uh, was so demonized. Um, 
and it's something that's so amazing, you know? And so I started to incorporate cannabis in my recovery. I read that you could use it as a sexual, um, to enhance a sexual experience as a lubricant. And I kind of didn't really believe it when I first read it. And I thought, well, you know what the heck, I'll try it. And I tried it and I was like, I think my life just changed. Like it was, it was an unbelievable experience. And um, when I was making bombs for myself, I was using coconut oil as my base. And coconut oil is great for so many things. For me personally, it's not a great lubricant. kills good bacteria. It almost instantaneously gives me yeast infection or some kind of issue. Um, so I went to a dispensary to buy a, a, a sexual lubricant that contained cannabis that wasn't coconut oil based. And I literally couldn't find one. Um, I went to three different dispensaries that day. Finally, I just started making it for myself in my kitchen using silicone as a base and like not knowing what I was doing, but just kind of mixing everything and hoping it would turn out well. And it turned out amazing. It was it was an amazing um, silicone based lubricant. And then I was bartending at the time and I would just give it to friends of friends or people like regulars that would come into to the bar and um one time somebody came in and he was like, hey, are you the weed loop girl? And I was like, oh my gosh, I am. Like, this is so funny that this is like a reputation, like it's spreading because people tried it and loved it. Um, and then as soon as he said that, something in my brain clicked. And I was like, this needs to be a company. Like, this needs to be a business. And then I went through the process of starting a business. I hired a PhD chemist. We did 25 different formulations. Um, and then Lavinia was born. So had you already um, abandoned the idea of becoming a nun at this time? Yes, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a funny story. So I was um I was living in the states and the idea of becoming a nun was just so unheard of here. Definitely. You know, so we're intrigued. Never. Why? Why well, this is very yeah. intriguing. I was just very I, you know, I had a really great experience with faith and I realized so many people didn't, but um I had a really great parents, I had a really great church. It was really something that was quite enjoyable to me, um, which is part of why I wanted to continue it on. But I was also like um, social chair of my sorority. So there was kind of like a yin and a yang where I was living in the real world, you know, but I was just really uh, passionate about this and very developed. But I was I was a little bit embarrassed to tell people because it was so uh, not the traditional norm. Um, so I decided to study abroad in Ireland because that's where my ancestors are from. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. I'm going back to the homeland. <laughs> and so um, I was randomly assigned to live in a house with four guys and four girls. And there were six different co countries represented. And it was so fun. It was the it was like Big Brother, the reality show for cultural clashes and uh, different experiences with different people. It was it was amazing. It was such a great experience. I was randomly assigned to live with a man named Francois. Mm, I think I saw that name on your bio. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Francois was a Belgium knight uh, who was you know, everything that you should be if you're going to take someone away from the nunnery. <laughs> so in that house, were you all training to become? Um, no. Okay. So what was no, the, no, no. So this house? Was it actually nun training or? No, it was just a study abroad program. Okay. But I decided that I was going to go through my own discernment process during that time. So okay. that was a time that I was going to take to focus and pray and, uh, you know, really decide if this was a path I wanted to go down. Um and so Francois was just amazing. He spoke five different languages. He was just delightful in every possible way that you, you could ever imagine. And I was like, I didn't know that there were men named like Francois out there. <laughs> like, I didn't know that that existed in the world. Sure. So maybe I don't want to be a nun anymore. Did you know what kind of nun you wanted to be? Because there's so many different types of, of nuns. Did you know which type? No, I hadn't really gone that far in the process. It was just for me that the, the um, if I wanted to go through the steps of actually taking the vows, because once I take a vow, I take that pretty seriously. So, um, and and it was it, it was really interesting. I actually did um, went to Rome during that time, and that's kind of where I made my final discernment. And I was in the Sistine Chapel, and I was praying, and I was like, you know, God, what what should I do? And it's really interesting because um, if you're a devout person of faith, uh, traditionally you feel like God's will, whatever is God's will, whatever God wants. And it was really interesting because what I perceived in praying was that God said, well, what do you want? 
-hmm. what life do you want? And I said, well, I really want to get married and I really want to have kids and I want to have like more of a traditional life. And he said, well, that's when you should do that. And um, part of my Catholic guilt, I was like, but what if there's no more nuns? Like, what if people don't enter into the nunhood or priesthood and then it dies out and, (laughs) you know, and then there are no more nuns and priests. And, and I felt like God told me like, that is not your burden to carry you you go live the life that you want to live, which I think is so interesting because that's not normally what people, you know, it's it's very much about what God wants and not what we want. And I think God wants us to do what we want. <laughs> I, I would definitely agree. So what was it about the non-life that appealed to you? Was it the helping others? What what what, what was it? The the devotion or what was what was the aspects that appealed to you? Exactly. Yeah. Helping others. I think I was going to go to, to an orphanage and help mm-hmm. with kids. Um, I had a really great upbringing. I had a really great childhood. Uh, giving that child, giving a, a great childhood to somebody else was something I was really interested in. Being of service to other people, um, being you know, spreading kindness, spreading love, spreading spreading all of these beautiful things to make the world a better place. What I realized is you can still do that Absolutely. without becoming a nun. Definitely, you know, it's interesting because um, when I was about. Um, until the age of 11, I wanted to be a nun as well. I, was, I mean, I had, a, yeah, I, had, I had a very, um, I was, I had I have an Irish Catholic family. So we're going to mass all the time. I went to Catholic schools. My best friend was from a very, very Catholic family. We were going to charismatic masses, you know, when they received the Holy Spirit and stuff. I mean, really, I was really into all of this. And I was, I was really obsessed with um, reading female saints stories and I was really impressed by the resilience, you know, because normally women, we don't think of women as being, you know, you know, if you really have a, a faith or be- belief in something, you know, going the extra mile to to be loyal to that idea. And I was really impressed by that. But then I read something in Corinthians about woman being the glory of man, not the glory of God. It's about, you know, covering her head. And I was like, ooh, the book was closed then forever for me. <laughs> but it's interesting because one of my questions for you is, um, how did your beliefs change like from then to now, like your beliefs towards sex and your beliefs towards like religion and spirituality? Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like now I'm I'm actually connected to God stronger than I ever have been. Um, and uh, in in I, I feel like it's it's hard because I really want to be open to everything and really try to not be judgmental, like really hard, (laughs) try Mm -hmm. not judgmental. But for me, it's, it's, it's so much about, we all have different experiences in our life and in our lifetime. And those experiences, they create who we are as people, um, our thoughts, our feelings. And I think it's really hard to have like overall rules governing every single person when everybody's experience in life is so different, everybody's um, uh, where everyone is at in their life is so different as well um, in terms of in how I perceive sex. Like I, I think I really love to empower people to um, do what makes them feel comfortable and do what makes them feel strong and feel powerful and feel like they're in control of their own sexual journey. For some people, it's abstinence. For some people, it's different sexual partners every day. There is no rhyme or reason. There is no one way, in my personal opinion. Um, I, I think it's. I think that something that's pretty significantly lacking um, is sexual education, and I think that it kind of stems from the fact that we're taught abstinence. If you're if you're of the faith, you're taught abstinence from a very young age, and the that can be great for so many people if that's what makes you feel amazing. But um, if you do it because this is something that you feel like you have to do because you're going to let God down or your parents down or people down if you decide to become sexually active. Um, what happens is your relationship with sex changes and it no longer becomes something that's fun and exciting and empowering and connects two people together and and, and your endorphins are released and, you know, it, it's a great act of intimacy. It suddenly becomes something that you're scared of, that you fear, that you don't want to participate in. And we say, you know, especially in people of faith, we say don't have sex until you're married, married but then once you're married, you can have as much sex as you want. Right. But the problem is, is that there's so many people that have performance anxiety. There's so many people that don't know what to do, that it's super awkward. It's uncomfortable. And, and the problem is, is it's, there's, there isn't really a place where they can ask questions or learn because it's like, oh, well, now you're married. Go have sex. And it's like, well, no, wait, what do I do? <laughs> 
And um, and I think that that sexual education is so empowering and so necessary. It's um, it's something that I think is pretty significantly lacking, which you've spoken about before, which I appreciate. oh yeah, definitely, definitely, and it's so important. Um, and I think we're all in, in this world, in the sex positive world, we're all trying to you know fill a gap that wasn't you know because I, I was in a Catholic school, so we had one class which was an hour, and it was all about puberty and then stuff. That, you know, there was no mention of clitoris. It was just about reproduction and then at the protestant school down the road they were putting condoms on cucumbers so and at the catholic school there was lots of teenage pregnancies you know so like in the uk is a very bad it's a very bad um there's a very high rate of teenage teenage pregnancies so it's just like this um belief that you know you just have to cross your fingers or the abstinence is the only way and that this natural thing that's happening to your body is really bad which is really disempowering so i think um, and now I, I've gone this whole full circle. I kind of denied religion for a long time, and now I'm back to God. And um, I just not not in a spirit, not in a relig- religious way, but more a spiritual way. And I really believe that like sexuality is a great gift. I, I have a video on my YouTube channel called "God Gave Me a Clitoris." Hallelujah! Yeah, <laughs> it's just just so cool. Because <laughs> I mean, it's like you know, it's the parable of the talents. You got to use what you have, you know, and not not waste it. Yeah, Amen. That's so powerful. <laughs> Definitely. So talk about, let's go back to um, the lubricant. So um, how, what was the creation process like? How did you go from the idea of launching your first product? Um, what were the challenges? Were there anything, was there anything that you didn't anticipate? Because it's obviously very quite difficult to create um, a product and then maybe getting approval, getting licenses. I mean, what, what was it? Was there anything that surprised you a lot? And what was, yes. how did it take? Yes, it's, um, uh, cannabis is a very regulated industry, especially in the state of California, which is great in so many ways. Also, it's a little bit crazy in so many ways too. Um, so I think, it, 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 what was the first question you said? How, lo- how long did it take or how? Um, what was- how did you go from idea to launching the product? I mean, um, what was that process like? What were your challenges? And was there anything that you didn't anticipate? Any? Yes, the- yes, yes. So I, as soon as the guy said, are you the weed loop girl? Okay. I, was like, I am. I am the weed loop girl, and I think I want to be the weed loop girl for the rest of my life. Um, and so from there, I just I I really realized that there was a need for this in in the cannabis industry. That there wasn't any company that was specifically designed to enhance people's sex lives. And so I saw that gap, and I said, "That's that's where I want to go, and that's where I want to fill it." And to be honest with you. It's been really amazing because one thing has led to another opportunity, has led to another opportunity, has led to another opportunity. Um, There are so many uh, challenges that you don't anticipate. And so there's there's so many learning. Like you just learn. I like to make small mistakes, inexpensive ones, hopefully. Um, But just in every way, I actually, um, you know, we had a pump issue when we first launched. The first three months, we had no issues with our pump. And then we started experiencing people having issues pumping our product correctly, which is devastating, right? Because you just launch a company and you want everything to work properly. And then something like having a packaging issue um, is 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 pretty, it feels overwhelmingly deadly. It's not that big of a deal. In the long run, we just push over into a tincture bottle and it's totally fine. Um, but in terms of like the regulations for California are are very strict and they're always changing so for example we came out with packaging we printed packaging you have to put a prop 65 warning on all of your packaging in the state of california and we printed it all and then they changed the prop 65 warning and so we then had to sticker over all of the packaging to be compliant um, for the change of the prop 65 so in the time of ordering packaging to when we got the packaging the laws literally changed in that interim so it's kind of um, it's kind of frustrating. It's 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 hard because it's very frustrating. But at the same time, I also try to be really grateful of the fact that it is legal now. And of course, there's going to be um, bumps along the road of of growing. Just you know, any industry. And I'm happy to kind of be in the industry at such an early phase of it being legal, um, and hoping to just continue to grow with it. What really surprised me because I've been I've been uh, quite familiar with lots of CBD products. I mean, here in Barcelona, I mean, you can go to an association and uh, buy cannabis um, as a, in a private members club, and also there are lots of CBD shops around. 
Um, so I was really surprised to see that there's THC in, in your products because I've never seen that before. Um, so so what is the impact of THC on orgasms? Because I don't know if, if it's like that in California, but it's like here that it's, the THC is almost like a bad word in the CBD world. You know, it's all, really? yeah, if you go to these shops where people are using cannabis as wellness products, it's all CBD, CBD, no THC. And they have warning saying there's no, there's like zero zero point one percent which is, you know, but it's all kind of, um, trying to assure the person that's not going to, that's not going to make them high or something. So yeah, it's very different. So I was really surprised to see that here. Is that's, that, is very that... funny. that's very funny. Um, so cannabis is a vasodilator. So mm-hmm. essentially what it means is, you know, when you smoke weed and sometimes your eyes mm-hmm. turn red, the actual size of the blood vessels are increasing in size, which is increasing the blood flow. And okay. so when you apply it topically below the belt, what it does is it increases the blood flow. Um, and so anytime you have increased blood flow in that area, heightened orgasms for women, you know, blood flow is how men get erections as well. So blood flow is a really good thing. Um, there is an onset time of 15 minutes to a half hour. And that onset time is really important to be aware of because it really does take that time to really increase the blood flow. What I love about this product is it's still me producing the orgasm. It's still my body doing it. It's still, it's it's all me, but it's just the increased blood flow. What it does is it takes the pressure off of me because sometimes when you're having a sexual experience, you know, it's, it. sometimes it has to be super rhythm, rhythmic and if you stop the motion for two seconds, your orgasm can be lost forever. Whereas like when I have that increased blood flow in that area, I know that I'm going to have a really strong, really intense orgasm. So I don't have to worry about it. So it kind of, for me, helps with performance as well. Um, you don't get a head high from it. So you, it, you apply, apply, applied vaginally, you don't actually receive like the psychoactive effects. I say that, but cannabis is... Um, Cannabis works with everybody's endocannabinoid system differently. So so I, so I want to say most of the time, like 99% of the time, it will not get you high. But there's always that rare person that, you know, can eat 100 milligrams of gummies and never experiences a high. Like, they're, they're, because, you, you know, cannabis is, is different for everybody. Um, we are coming out with a before sex gummy and an after sex gummy. The before sex gummy heightens you. It has... Um, horny goat weed, lawn jack, uh, macaroon is designed to help again with the increased blood flow. And then we are have um, after sex gummies and that just knocks you out and puts you to sleep. It has valerian root um, in there as well. And it just it just knocks you out. Um, and then we are also working on anal shooters that we're going to launch very soon for enhanced pleasure during anal sex. And that product I'm so excited about because Anal sex is something that's not talked about, not researched. <laughs> there, you know, I was, I'm kind of a nerd, and I like to read medical journals because I think that that's the best way to get information is from the source of, you know, the 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 people doing the study. And there is no studies about anal sex, and I mean, very little subject studies about anal sex, but then anal sex and um, cannabis, there's like none. So I would love to, I'm going to see if we can try to get a clinical study. It's pretty expensive to do, Um, but that does give you a head high. And what it does is it creates like this really amazing tingling feeling. Um, So it just makes anal sex uh, pretty amazing. I guess more relaxing for that area. But so I'm understanding that there are two purposes of the lubricants. There's one is to actually lubricate and the other is to kind of, stimulate would you say or enhance the sensation exactly increase the blood flow exactly so it's not going to be like a where you put um uh essential oil where it's like tingly or burny or it doesn't really have that effect what it does is it just makes everything much more sensitive because your um because your blood is just flowing to that area you know, I love the idea of the uh, before and after sex gummies. Would that get you a bit high as well? Because it would have THC. Yes, yes, those, yes, correct. Those have THC and get you high. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, would you choose yeah. sativa then? I mean, would you choose sativa to kind of like what? What, what would you? We use live me? resin. So we're currently using a live resin uh, for one of ours and a distillate for the other one. Okay, because I used to smoke and I don't anymore. But um, it was always sativa or indica. I used to get indica all the time just to kind of sleep. So I'm not, I'm not yeah. sure which which one will be better for. Yeah, it's interesting because they're so bred these days that it's very mm. hard to get a pure bread, mm. pure bread of anything. You know, they're they're it's very hybrids. hard to get like a true most of most of the uh, what's on the market are hybrids right now. Mm. Wow. 
Um, so I'm assuming um, that you chose to use silicone just for that long lasting effect. Then if you have to wait a long time until the actually you're getting those um, enhancement um, effects and to yeah. maintain the lubrication as well. I really personally love silicone lubricants. Um, first of all, it's condom compatible. So mm -hmm. oil-based lubricants are not. So I, I kind of cut out oil-based lubricants. A water-based lubricant is really great and feels amazing. The problem is you have to use non nanotechnology in order to get the cannabis to emulsify in, into the lubricant. And that typically tastes really bad. We did about okay. six months of R&D. And some of our testing groups said that they had to stop their sexual experience and brush their teeth which is less than oh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> or they stopped having sex altogether after they brushed their teeth because it kind of tastes like soapy chemically. Mm. And the problem is vaginally, you can't add any sugar. Normally you can do like blockers or add sugars or like there's things that you can do to kind of combat the taste issue. Um, but we just really wanted to keep it very pure. So we just use dimethicone, dimethicanol, which is a silicone blend. And then we use uh, THC and CBD distillates. So we just have it very, very pure, you know, four ingredients, you know what they are. Um, and, and then, uh, so yeah, so we didn't want to do the water base as technology moves on. And maybe if they can remove some of the taste, we'll consider doing water, water based again. Um, but for now, that's basically why we decided to do silicone and it's great for both vaginal and anal use. Um, it's waterproof. So it's really long lasting, Especially if you're having anal sex, you want to make sure that you're using a lubricant that is a very long-lasting lubricant. Water-based lubricants evaporate, mm -hmm. um, so that's why you have to continually reapply them, which if you're using it vaginally, um, it's not that big of an issue. If you're using it anally, it's a very big issue because you can tear, you can actually um, hurt yourself pretty considerably. Anyone wow. else? Sex has known that. <laughs> <laughs> it must be interesting having these um, the, the, re the testing process. It is. It is. It is. It's very yes, yes, and and also it's very funny how desensitized um, I become talking about it. Mm. So do you have a pool of people that you you test with? Um, do you yeah. Yes, typically. Typically, what we do, we have about a, a pool of about twenty five people that we use on a regular basis. Um, we ask that the partners are not the first time partners if they're do if they can use it. Um, by themselves solo or with a partner and if it's with a partner we ask that it's a partner that they've had um at least five over five to ten um sexual experiences with because first time partners there can be so many other factors it's really hard to quantify a sexual experience <laughs> um the really cool part is that there's a vibrator called the lioness that has sensors on the oh, side yeah. Or it's the pulsing of the vaginal walls during a sexual experience so what's really neat is we actually have like scientific data to show how much better our orgasm is than without using a lubricant, which is- Yeah, I have, I have 800 toys, but I don't have a lioness. I've always wanted it for that reason because I just think biofeedback is fascinating. It's so fa it's so fascinating to be able to look at your orgasm and compare it to other or orgasms that you've had and see like how it's just, it's it's wild. It's mind blowing. Amazing. Uh, let me see what else. Um, so what are you working on at the moment? You told me that you're doing the before and after sex guys mm -hmm. yeah we're actually very close to launching those we're just finishing up our packaging um and then we're we're starting manufacturing so probably within a month um to a month and a half we'll have those on the market which i'm really excited about amazing so what, what about after that do you, do you have any plans yes um the anal shooters that are mm -hmm. going to come after that and then um and then after that we are going to expand into a hemp line for broader distribution currently you can only buy us in dispensaries in the state of california um which is a, a very challenge it's a very challenging that's part of what's so challenging about the cannabis industry is that it's it's not federally legal it's only legal state by state they the state uh, dictates if it's legal or not. And so if you want to expand to another state where it is legal, you have to set up a manufacturing facility in that state. You have to adhere to their guidelines, apply for their licenses, um, uh, do whatever packaging. Typically, it's a child-resistant packaging, which is a little bit more expensive than regular packaging. Um, so it's very cumbersome and very labor-intensive to expand in the cannabis industry currently. I'm hopeful that that will not be forever.
That's would you would you consider doing it without THC to be actually able to have more distribution? Yes. Yeah. So we're working on a hemp line. Um, we take a lot of time in R and D. We really want our products to work and be the best. So we're currently in R and D for for the for our hemp line to make our hemp lube. Cool. So how did you find the name Lavinia? Uh, she. My girlfriend actually uh, named it. She is a Roman sex goddess. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of like a name that hasn't been associated with too much. So we're hoping to brand it. So when you hear Lavinia, you think about cannabis and sex. Amazing. I love it. I just booked a flight to Rome today. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've never well, been. You gotta go to the Sistine Chapel and and have a prayer. <laughs> okay, maybe I will. I definitely will after this after the, after speaking to you. Um, so I have a couple of quick questions for you. Um, what is the book that changed your life? No. At what stage of my life? Any any stage. Um. I would say think and grow rich. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I would say um, how to win friends and influence people. Um, and I would say, uh, this is very silly, but there's an author uh, named Michael Codley, and he writes a detective series call, uh, about a, a detective named Harry Bosch, and the series is called Bosch. And when I was moving to Los Angeles, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything about LA and the the whole um the book takes place in LA and he talks about all these restaurants like Dantana, Dantana's, Musso and Frank's. Um he talks about Fountain and Vine and all of these great places in LA. And when I was driving here, I listened to the book on um C D and that's how long ago it was. <laughs> and um and then it gave me like a, a really good foundation for LA. And so when I would drive and I would see Dan Tana's or Musso and Frank's, um, I, I suddenly felt like I had an intimate connection to the city. And I listened to it every night before I go to bed because it gives me feelings of nostalgia, which is weird that a murder mystery gives me feelings of nostalgia. But um, but that book, that, that kind of whole series, I would say uh, had a really profound impact in my relationship with LA and the place that I now live. So that would be my third one. Amazing. So I'm glad you mentioned uh, Think and Grow Rich because that changed my perception about sexuality and about the power of it. Does it have yes. about for you? Yeah, he talks about sexual energy a lot. Yeah, it, that was just um, mind blowing for me because I just thought I knew a lot about sexuality because my focuses were been on you know pleasure, overcoming taboo. And then I was like, wow, there's a whole new level here. There's it's about power, and that's what the real that's why it's taboo in my opinion because. Um, we're not supposed to have so much power. Amen. Wow. Yeah. And that, when did you read that recently, or was that um, how did it I, I, I read it about once a year because okay. it's a. I do audiobooks. I have a dog, okay. so I have this a lot of time walking my dog, and I also have hair, which takes a lot of time to do. So I feel okay. like I have a lot of a lot of time on my hands to listen, um, as opposed to sit down and actually read. So I would say once a year, at minimum, I read it. Okay, I recently did the workbook with a friend. I'd recommend that. It's, it's oh, literally great. exercises. So it's really nice to, you know, meet up with someone and compare and contrast and get a different perspective on things. So yes. That is something you miss in audiobooks is any yeah. kind of workbook element. That's a good That's a good note. Great. So um, what phrase or affirmation do you live by? It would be the motto of our company, which is live life to the climax. I love Every it. day that means something so different to me. Some days it's staying in bed and watching a movie. Other days it's taking a hike. Other days it's having brunch with girlfriends. It's um, it's something that I try to live by every day. I love it. Because I've got the tagline of this podcast is every day is a climax. And the podcast make lifestyle. There you go. I love it. Definitely. So what's your favorite thing about working in this industry compared to others? I really love how most people are very open-minded here in this industry. And I really love that cannabis speaks to so many different people and it's a very diverse playground. And I really, really, really love the fact that it runs the gamut. Every you know social background, every economic background is represented in this industry. What do you think is more scandalous, let's say, that the cannabis or the sex? 
this is the current bane of my existence. So it is probably the sex element is a lot harder than the cannabis element. But when you combine the two, you're really in a bad situation. So I actually just did an Instagram post today encouraging people. There is um, the Senate is trying to pass a law called AB 4016. That could be totally wrong. I, I don't remember the numbers, but it's essentially about making cannabis advertising and packaging more restricted, which is very difficult because I can't advertise in traditional ways. I can't do Google ads. Um, I can't, I re, it's really like my hands are tied behind my back. We have to think so hard outside of the box. Mm -hmm. We can't even do Instagram ads or TikTok ads or any, any social media. We can do testimonials. So if we give people the product and they try it and they, they, they do a testimonial or they talk about it, but we can't do a call to action. So we can't have them link to our website at all or a link to a dispensary where they can buy it. It's very, it's very, very, very frustrating the way that um, cannabis advertising is treated in the state of California. It's very same with sex as well. Yeah. But then you add sex on top mm. of it. Um, the Lock Ness actually was a great um, uh, motivation for me because what they did is they had people read testimonials of people that used their vibrators. And so that was kind of a way that they were able to like skirt around um, Mod, which is another uh, yeah. uh, brand. They uh, were having all kinds of trouble and then they added a candle. So then they weren't just a sex based you know, it was obviously like a sex candle and designed for sexual things, but um, that's how they were able to get around some of their advertising issues. But it's it's really um, it's really frustrating because I feel like what we're trying to do is very wholesome, mm -hmm. and um, it's really frustrating the way that we're being treated. Definitely, because I think people have this assumption that sex sells, but you have to work really hard, don't you? You have to do lots of. You no, know, it's it's it can get shut down any time. There's just so many challenges in this in yeah. this industry. Mm. Yeah, too many, in my opinion. <laughs> Definitely. So, where can people find you? So you can check us out on our website, olavinia.com, O H L A V I N I A dot com, and there's a where to buy section. So you can see where we're available at, what dispensaries we're available at in the state of California. And like I said, we're hoping that um, 2024, we're going to launch with our hemp line. And that way, you can, we will be able to ship it nationally. I'm not even sure about international. We have to look into international laws, but it'll there will be a much broader distribution opportunities there. Definitely. So um, what about your, your social media accounts? So my, um, it's o.lavinia is our Instagram. And um, my personal one is underscore Katie underscore Enright, E-N-R-I-G-H-T underscore. Um, and please, yeah, follow us. We're going to create some really cool content. A lot of it's going to be sexual education based, which is super fun. And um, you'll be able to see too when we launch our before and after sex gummies and our anal shooters. I wish I could try them. A bit difficult in Barcelona, but it just sounds like such a great, um, a great idea, and that's been so much fun to try them as well. It's yeah. If if you like anal sex at all, or even if you don't like it, this is gonna make, <laughs> like it. This is gonna make it a lot better of a situation for you. <laughs> that could maybe help people with um, what's it called, vaginismus, or you know, when they yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely, yeah, 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 absolutely, it does because it increases the blood flow and it just causes everything to kind of open up, um, especially for. Uh, for anal sex, it just, for me, it just makes it pleasant. Like it's, it mm. can be a very unpleasant situation if you are with a partner that doesn't um, sometimes take time, mm. the time that's needed or the energy that's needed to kind of open up. It just, it just kind of relaxes you a lot, which is good. Fantastic. So thank you so much for joining us today on the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast. It's definitely been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure's all mine. The book I'm reading now is Healing Honestly, The Messy and Magnificent Path to Overcoming Self-Blame and Self-Shame. And this is the least re-traumatizing read on childhood sexual abuse for survivors by a survivor. And this is written by Elisa Zipersky. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. And Elisa is going to be a future guest on this podcast, and that's why I'm reading this book. Also, it's a topic that I have not really 
researched a lot at all. But I think it's very important to have these conversations because after all, sexuality is not just about orgasms and pleasure and intimacy. There is also a very dark side to sexuality that is more more um, is more present than we think, actually, but we don't talk about it enough. And there are many survivors out there. And now I touched on this when I re- um, interviewed Dr. Eric Fitzmedrud that um, about my own Me Too experiences. And when the Me Too movement started, I realized that my experiences were not just a rare occurrence, unfortunately. It was actually much more prevalent than, than what I thought. And um, that's a good and a bad thing. Obviously, it's bad that these things happen so frequently. But I felt that um, I felt it kind of normalized my own situation, which is um, we shouldn't be normalizing this type of thing, of course. But I felt less strange and less shame about it, to be honest, knowing that it's something that a lot of people deal with. And I think it's important to have these conversations rather than carry the burden of shame. I'm um, about halfway through this book now, and it's very interesting that in that it speaks from a personal perspective but also it has lots of research um, cited in the book as well. And what's very interesting for me is talking about how it starts talking about um, memory and how sometimes we don't um, remember our abuse in a very clear way. And that's something that happened to me. Um, I experienced something and then I I completely forgot about it. I didn't forget about it. It kind of like got compartmentalized in my brain and then I remembered years and years later, and uh, it wasn't just one occurrence, it was a series of occurrences. And um, I, I just couldn't believe how I had forgotten about something that was, or I hadn't thought about something that I hadn't forgotten about, if that makes any sense. So that was very interesting how the memory works and also how your body can store trauma. And uh, that was how my trauma was activated. I was in a situation that was very similar to something else I'd lived, and that triggered this memory um, and this response that I I wasn't really anticipating. And now I'm, I realize that this particular reaction that I had was not so strange at all. It's actually quite common. And also what's interesting about sexual abuse and um, sexual harassment, anything that's kind of, um, you know, the not cool part of sexuality is that, you know, um, it's with other ad- um, things in life, let's say addictions like alcohol or drugs, when we want to get those, if those things are causing us harm, we want to eliminate them completely. Whereas sexuality is, is not something you would, wa- I mean, most people don't want to eliminate completely from their lives. They want to live it in a, in a, in a way, but it's, it's learning how to reframe your perspectives on sexuality. And um, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a lot of reframing that, that needs to be done in order to let go of what's been done and those traumatic memories and then be able to embrace your body and being touched and all of those things in a consensual manner. So it's real, it's a real, real journey. And uh, it also talks about how we talk to our friends about our situations that we can, so we can share the burden, so to speak. And it talks about lots of myths as well. It's quite, um, I wanted, I was going to do this interview with Elisa last week. I was going to read the book in a few days, but I realized I had to take it a bit slower um, just because um, I, I have, this is the first book I've read like this and um, I'm kind of like facing my own situations. But in my situation, I actually did a lot of therapy when I was younger and I found it to be very helpful at first. Um, and it was something that it felt like it was kind of draining. I used to come out of sessions and be quite tired, you know, the crying and just um, facing my demons and um feeling um, absolutely emotionally drained. I didn't couldn't really do anything afterwards. I just went home and maybe saw my flatmates or just spent time alone, but I couldn't like go out or go to a class or anything like that because this was a time when I was at university. But over time, I realized that it, it wasn't becoming helpful to readdress things from the past all the time. I think the therapist that I've seen, I've touched on this before in other episodes, the therapists I have seen have really focused on a kind of Freudian modality where everything is related to the cause and, and the childhood. And I, as I get older, I just think I want to be solution based. I don't want to be rehashing and going over things of the past and trying to make connections with my present life. And that was some, that was the reason why I stopped doing therapy when I was at university, because it, it just seemed like the therapist was linking everything in my present day to things in my childhood. And I thought, no, this is not really empowering for me. I mean, everyone has different ways of dealing with things and different ways of 
of coping and, and being a survivor. But for me, I just thought, yeah, I've done it now. I've faced it. But now it's time to kind of move on. I think for me, there was a there was different phases. At first, there was a real sadness of that that happened to me, and especially the fact that I didn't feel correct um, protected. And there's a kind of anger as well towards the person, you know. Um, and then there's a kind of um, acceptance, and then a letting go. And I think from now it's created a more awareness um, about the topic. And now I'm able to talk about these things and not feel triggered or that I want to cry or anything like that. It's just a more of a matter of fact approach. Yeah, the, the pain is still there. The frustration is still there. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm just kind of like getting on with my life and um, and um, kind of grateful for this awareness that I have because this, this is actually reinforces why I think sexuality is such an important topic. So many people are carrying burdens of shame around with them and it never goes away. And there was something in this book that actually really um, I found to be um, very, um, not triggering, but kind of provocative for me. It was about the purity culture. And I mean, a lot of um, um, in religious um, communities, abuse can be quite rife. And um, and it, there was some quote here that I can't actually find right now, but it talked about there's no reason to feel shame. The shame should be with your perpetrator and the communities who, you know, um, who made, who kind of like um, kept you silent. So that was something that I found to be very eye-opening. I think a lot more people need to hear that message as well. So let me see if I can find that very quickly. Um, okay, so we are not bad or wrong or broken. We have nothing to atone for. We are worthy of compassion and healing. And also my advice to other survivors working through this is to remember that the shame is not yours to carry. It belongs to your perpetrator and to the culture that kept you silent. That's very important. And also it says, um, yeah, so so it's interesting. Um, the, the word silent reminded me of my most recent um, times having therapy. And my therapist was telling me that I come from silence so about, you know, the sexuality um, was always something that's very hush-hush. Um, where I grew up and that's probably what has influenced me and inspired me to do what I do today just to have these conversations create a platform and hold space for people to share their expertise and stories and perspectives on this incredibly important topic that makes the world move and that's not just something that's orgasmic it's something that is essential so that is healing honestly the messy and magnificent path to overcoming self-blame and self-shame by Elisa Sapersky. Now it's time to slow things down as we prepare for this episode's guided affirmations meditation. It's probably not a good idea to listen to this while driving or operating machinery. Instead, take a break from whatever you're doing, get comfortable, take a deep breath and enjoy.
I am a vessel of divine light and love during sex. Sex is a gateway to transcendent states of consciousness. I manifest my desires through the spiritual power of sexual energy. I am grateful for the spiritual lessons of intimacy. My body is a temple of love and pleasure. I connect with the divine through the ecstasy of sex. Sex is a sacred transformative act. Our lovemaking is a sacred ritual that deepens our spiritual bond. I embrace the divine sensuality that resides within me. With each breath, I draw in spiritual energy, enhancing our connection. I am grateful for the spiritual lessons of intimacy. My body is a temple of love and pleasure. I connect with the divine through the ecstasy of sex. I surrender to the flow of love and spirit in our union. Our sexual energy is a powerful force for healing and transformation. In the embrace of our passion, I experience oneness with the universe. I am open to the wisdom and guidance of the divine in our intimacy. I am grateful for the spiritual lessons of intimacy. Are you looking for a new sex toy? If you are, go to satisfier.com and you can use the code VENUS to get 30% off anything on the satisfier.com website. So check it out, VENUS for 30% off, satisfier.com. To find out more about me and my orgasmic lifestyle, visit venusohara.org or follow me on Instagram at instagram.com slash venusohara. Make sure to search for the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast by Venus O'Hara in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Thanks for listening, have an orgasmic week, and make sure every day is a climax.